Once upon a time, there was a city of so many stories that they ran through its streets and slid down its rooftops like rainwater. Over time, the story-soft hearts of the city grew colourless, concrete cold and cheerless, its history hidden behind progress and punctuality. Every morning and evening, the city's people ran from its houses and became a many-legged and many-wheeled beast, belching money and smoke and all things modern. The beast rarely saw more than the pavement before its smart shoed feet. The beep of the story soft heart grew fainter and fainter until only those who strained to listen for its rhythm could hear it. People rarely stopped to listen and they rarely stopped to look. But all was not lost. Seven sneaky stitches had stepped outside the stampede. They heard the heartbeat, they sensed the city shiver and they resolved to do something about it. From the darkest corner of the library rustled the blue stocking stitcher in a cloud of ancient words and degenerate butterflies. From the vampire haunted ballrooms of Vienna waltzed the purple perla, a distant cousin of the scarlet pimpernel with a crocheted calling card. From the ovine crop grasses of Wales and New Zealand shuffled Shaun of the Dead, her thread snipping shuriken about her neck. From the Far East mountaintops leapt Knitting Ninja in a whirl of cherry blossom and crafty kung fu. From the rolling country hills rode Lady Loop, who secretly siphoned fleeces of the gentry sheep and stuffed them in her saddlebags. From behind the silver screen crept the fastener, all buttons and bows and misbehaviour. And from the depths of the London underground stalked deadly nitshade, her army of tube mice at her feet and her knit blasts at her fingertips. Knit the city was born of hands not content to lounge idly on the arms of living room sofas, of a rhythm of stitch after stitch that slowed the daily whirlwind to an easy amble, and a bone-aching passion for a city we have all fallen in love with. There was no intention behind it to begin with. Each agent of Knit the City Yarn Corps unexpectedly found their stitching story suddenly tangled with those of the streets. My first solo knit blast, a moment when the knitting I created and the space I am sat in suddenly snapped together, took place before the disapproving eyes of the quite frankly terrifying blue whale in London's Natural History Museum. <laughs> it was not a case of look at me or look at what I made. It was a stitched squeal of delight, a knitted tug at the sleeve or squeeze at the hand of those who visited after me, a breathless wall-based whisper of look where we are, isn't this place jaw-droppingly amazing? And really, nothing more. When winter hit London and washed the streets in wind, the Knit the City Yarn Corps was officially formed. Six sneaky stitches with the seventh more recent agent, who crafted for all kinds of reasons, but whose love of craft and passion for the city's stories tied them together. In our secret wall-lined bunker in an undisclosed location, we sat and planned our first yarn storm a combined series of yarn core knit blasts that ends, often unexpectedly, in something knittedly beautiful and scarily easy to love. London became our concrete and steel canvas. Amongst the tourist tangle of Covent Garden, we yarn stormed a wooden barrier. Returning hours later, we caught a group of French tourists standing about it, stroking it like it lived and breathed under its woolly pelt. In the CCTV infested Parliament Square, where protesters are moved along by weary police officers, we yarn stormed a phone box. Almost done, and the fuzz appeared to stop and search us. Bad cop handed us a stop and search notice, perturbed to find no box to tick to file a phone box cosy into a law-abiding <laughs> meet. Good cop smiled from under his peaked cap and took a photo on his phone for the wife, who likes a bit of knitting. <laughs> Tired office workers broke into the smiles they reserved for weekends. They stopped to throw their arms around the cosy communication cubicle, like the tree-hugging hippies that we all are deep down. In Waterloo's Leak Street Tunnel, the air is wheezy with spray can art, as graffitiists from all over the world lend their layer to the once banksy walls without having to worry about the long arm of the law. A legal graffiti area since 2008 it lacks the heart-squeezing rush of forbidden art, but makes up for it with less panicked swells of colour as artists find their freedom in the outdoors. Our Lake Street web of woe dragged craft into artists' territory. 
we trapped 44 horrified handmade creatures in the web of a fat yet famished knit the city spider. A full 13 feet from end to end, it twitched with the death throes of insects, myths, lost romances, rodents, dust sprites, and foul-mouthed butterflies that you could not take home to your kids. <laughs> <laughs> we were no longer simply covering objects in knitting. The city's stories were winding their way through our work. Our stitched squeals of delight now had the city speaking through them. Our latest project will highlight this. Today we are doing Knit the City's tributes at Oranges and Lemons. We have a church each and we have a line from the nursery rhyme each and we're going around putting our piece of graffiti knitting on each church separately. It feels like a scale on the wall. The purple perla impales herself. Going to St Martin's which is just around the corner. The bells of Old Bailey. Oh, this is really cool. I really love the orange and lemon sign. I've got all my kit in here, and we'll be putting Dick Whittington up there. He's got a cheeky expression. Six churches, six yarn storms, probably about six hours. Mischief managed, I think. Yes. Knit the City is also not just about London that we can reach out and wrap yarn around. It's also about the London that glows from our screens. We're the first and only yarn storming collective to drag the online world with us on uh, every trip. We tweeted the first ever live London yarn storm on Twitter, inviting followers to virtually stalk us on our oranges and lemons odyssey. Our city stories spoke to distant watchers who may never enjoy fish, chips and mushy peas, or get, or get tutted at when their Oyster card fails to work for the first time. <laughs> Our blog posted yarn storms guide people through a virtual London in a way a mere postcard picture might struggle to get across. Wikipedia states that yarn bombing is almost exclusively about beautification and creativity. We're hoping to add a line or two to that. Knit the City doesn't seek to change the world, to stop wars, egg the Prime Minister, or ratchet up the trendiness of the over 60s and their skills. <laughs> Though there isn't a granny we don't take our handmade, handmade hats off to. It is true that we yarn storm because it's just so much fun. London tempts us in with its long forgotten sagas, its rarely glimpsed corners of creativity and its twists of tradition. We can't help but go and can't help but drag the unsuspecting London commuter beast with us, take it warmly by its sweaty hands and worry it with our needles until it stands still and looks up. You'll most likely be surprised to know that the world is riddled with secret stashes of yarn storming groups, or yarn bombing as they call it in the USA, a phrase as Londoners we're reluctant to adopt for obvious reasons. There are crews worldwide from America's Knitter Please to Canada's yarn bombing to Australia's Girl and Dog to Holland's Knitted Landscape. We can't claim to be pioneers of the public pearl, we can't claim to be the first to battle the blinkered commuter beast. The idea that we're artists has, on occasion, made us laugh so hard we've dropped stitches. <laughs> but as we relax in the safety of the wall lined knit the city bunker, sharpening our needles, sipping pear cider, and planning woolly city wide trails of tales, we realise something important. We do it even if none of you are watching. The city's story soft heart beats on beneath our stitches, and we all live happily ever after.